foreign languages at Waterville College. As a Baptist preacher, he served his congregation in Newton Century, Massachusetts. And he was a, uh, an editor of many of the Baptist uh, hymnals and uh, and he actually wrote over, composed more than 150 songs. But uh, while a student at the Andover Theological Seminary, he wrote the lyrics for My Country Tis of the Sweet Land of Liberty in 1831. 1831. A friend, Lowell Mason, had asked him to translate the lyrics in some of the German songbooks. And as you know, the tune, he had never heard that tune before. And he had no idea that that was uh, associated with God Save the King, which is the same, uh, same melody, you know, God Save the King. Uh, it was first performed on July the 4th in 1831 at an Independence Day celebration at Park Street Church in Boston. Uh, Smith died in 1895 on a train while he was en route to preach in Reedville, Massachusetts. Uh, 75 years later, he was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Uh, George Gershwin was in that year, and, and uh, Richard Rogers, some of the famous people on Broadway. So we're just gonna sing, uh, <coughs> sing my country. Bill? Are you? <laughs> Are you of sound mind and body? <laughs> Partially both. Sandy, it's are you in a ball? Two twenty six is short. Two twenty six is short. One more calendar tonight. I made a mistake. I came up the stairs. Oh, God. Well, I see. Okay. I'll have to go along with that. Just, uh, you can hum. We'll sing the first, second, last verse of My Country, Tis of Thee. Woo! I stand up for that one. All right. <laughs>
paper Fellowship, which couldn't do anything with it, but we felt we could. And uh, ended up, I went back there five years later, and they they finished redoing the camp. But they couldn't. They felt they were going to have to make a college out of it. They couldn't get any students, and it, it had become a very prosperous convention center. But anyway. I said, I don't, I got involved in this thing. And what happened was, through the auspices of the North Carolina Baptist men, we would get groups of us throughout the Baptist Convention. And then you care whether you if you're a Southern Baptist or Cooperative Baptist or Hebrew, <coughs> you know, they'd take it. Because they were looking for working people. And so we had, the first time we had eight or nine guys win, and then the next time, uh, about 15, 20 guys. And then and, and my wife won the next But anyway, we, we, we did Habitat for Humanity type work. Created a lot of sawdust and debris and all that stuff. But I learned Virginia the hammer to hold and a lot of things like that. And you know I met the finest people I have ever met. Um, we, we, 
went to Bucharest, Romania, went to Prague twice, Bucharest twice, and they were redoing the church and school in Bucharest as they were in Prague. But in, in Bucharest, um, it was in the poorest section of town. And I mean, it was really poor. And they had to lock the gates uh, at 11 o'clock at night because packs of wild dogs ran around Lucarins. You could hear them. And you do well to get off the streets before 11 o'clock. But anyway, I met the finest people I've ever met. <coughs> and it just <clears throat> had a profound effect on me. I found out. I wasn't nearly as good as I thought I was, <laughs> but um, that didn't matter. God still loved it. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I learned how to do a little hammering and sewing in the meantime. But it made a, a not a hundred percent better person out of me, but it made a much better person out of me. And um, I can tell you that I'm not. I'm not as bad as I used to be, but I'm not as good as I'm going to be. Amen. <laughs> but I know I'm getting better. But at any rate, I am very <coughs> thankful for it. And, and I ask God for the wisdom to know what, is, what, what are you going to do with me for the rest of my life? <coughs> and I said, give me the wisdom to know what you want. And he did. <coughs> and, um, I just thank God every day that I get up for doing that for me. Amen. Because it just it made me a much better person than me. My wife thinks it three times a day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was a little bit of a rounder. But I was an all-star rounder. I was a zealot rounder. And it didn't end. It's like William Jenkins said, I might be used, but I ain't used up. But um, well, Wayland said that he never did anything to intentionally hurt anyone. And I, and I never, I, I never was mean or anything, but I was sorry. But at any rate, I got, I got a little less sorry and a little better. And I thank the Lord for that. And that's the reason I'm still around, I guess. I, I quit drinking and smoking and doing all the other kind of things. <laughs> And I'm glad I did that too. Mm -hmm. But I had fun while I was doing it. <laughs> At any rate, it was the wisest thing I ever did. And it's like Tom Sillick is on, you know, the police commissioner's got this commercial where he interviews people that took the home mortgage. Uh, anyway, one of them came up and said, that's the best thing I ever did, for sure. She was sure that and he's, and he's sure that she she's sure. Anyway, that was the smartest thing I ever did. And I would recommend that you do something similar to that. And you'll have peace of mind. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. It's nice to know it's working. Yeah. Yeah. I said thank you. It's nice to know it's working. <laughs> conform to the image of Christ, yes. right? Yes. That's what we all shoot for. Being more and more conformed to the image of Christ every day. So that was a great, Amen. great devotion. Um, today is the fifth in five uh, lessons. Um, uh, on the prophets proclaim God's power and um, I have the privilege today of um, reading and talking a little bit about a passage in Zechariah <laughs> we don't read the minor prophets very often um, and actually there's just uh, a few verses in Zechariah that we hear uh, Zechariah has been quoted uh, often in the New Testament, but um, 
but one of the passages that we're going to look at today is um, one of the ones that we hear most often, especially on Palm Sunday. Anyway, the first thing I want to do is I want to uh, I want us to think about gratitude because the way this passage starts out is rejoicing and being glad. Gratitude. So uh, let's shout out some things that we are grateful for. Let's let's start that way. Living in America. Living in the United yes. States of America. Yes, yes ma'am. This, this church. Yes. Our pastors, our staff, our church family, our personal families, friends, neighbors, colleagues at work that have had a positive impact on our lives. Our um, church choir. Our church choir. Yeah. I have not had the privilege of being in church to hear the new choir yet. And actually, I'm hoping, since uh, you all are now rehearsing again on Wednesday evenings, to maybe uh, become a part of the choir in the fall. That's one of my, I think the spirit is talking to me. Uh, I do love to sing. I'm not uh, um, trained in voice. Uh, but I do read music, and uh, so anyway. Uh, but anyway, we'll see. We'll see uh, if 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 that comes about, and um, and if that works out okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, anyway, um, the other things that you know, we do have. Uh, all of us have uh, certain material blessings that we can be thankful for, and hopefully, we remember every day that. Um, everything, all of creation, who we are, what we have, belongs to God. It's, it was His to begin with. So everything that we really have uh, is a gift from God. Amen. So we can all be grateful for that. So with that, uh, one of the questions uh, that they ask in the teacher's guide is, what does gratitude do for us? It does make us humble. It, it also, at least for me, uh, shifts my focus from the negative, and there's so much negativity in this world, and worries and concerns, to um, joy and happiness, lifts my spirits. Um, I've heard people like Oprah Winfrey that starts out every day making a list of what she's thankful for every day. And, and she claims, and I believe that, that it gets her day off to a great start um, and with a positive attitude. And, uh, and that's something that we might all want to try. How is gratitude connected to worship? Well, if you're praising the right one and thanking the right one, you're Exactly, you. exactly. And that's how we're going to start today. Our lesson, as I said before, is out of Zechariah. And before I actually read it, I wanted to uh, sort of put uh, the person of Zechariah in context just very briefly because I think it helps us understand. A lot of prophecy uh, is written um, in sort of Hebrew poetry form. Uh, and also, there's a lot of oracles, a lot of visions, a lot of dreams, and things like that. And sometimes, like Revelation, the symbolism can be hard to understand. But if you can kind of put it in the context in which it was written, it kind of helps you understand it. All we really know about Zechariah, well, number one, there's a lot of Zechariahs in the Bible. Uh, in the New Testament, Zechariah was the father of John the Baptist, if y'all will recall. Um, but this guy, all we know about him is he was the son of Ido, who was a priest in Jerusalem. And he was a contemporary of, I'm not sure if I'll pronounce it the way you guys, because every time I pronounce it, somebody says, do you mean so-and-so? I say Haggai. I don't know if y'all might call it Haggai or, anyway, uh, the prophet whose writings are right before Zechariah, they were contemporaries. And they were prophesying around 520 to 518. Now remember this is BC, so we're counting down to zero, okay? 
so 520 to 518 BC, and they were post-exilic prophets. So this would have been after the Babylonian exile, uh, when and after Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia, who defeated Babylon, gave all the Jews in the empire uh, permission to go back to Jerusalem and really encourage them to build the temple. Now that was in 538, um, and uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah, we read a lot about that initial period. Uh, they did go back, uh, they did carry all the vessels of the temple that the Babylonians had carried off, they carried them back with them, but they met a lot of resistance. They started out uh, rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple, but the local governors, Persians, local governors, you know, they didn't really, they weren't really excited about the Jews coming back. So they met a lot of resistance. So uh, things kind of got stalled out. Well, this is when we see Haggai and uh, Zechariah prophesy and encouraging uh, the people in Jerusalem to continue building the temple. And not only that, the building, rebuilding the city and the temple wasn't the only thing. They felt like there needed to be kind of a cleansing of the people too because you have to remember <coughs> that they had been exiled in places where, um, in a lot of cases, they could not worship like they did previously uh, in the temple. And, um, and so it, this was like a uh, do-over, a start-over for the people of Israel. So, um, so this is uh, when Zechariah was prophesying. Um, his book is kind of divided, chapters, it's uh, the longest of the minor prophets, it's 16 chapters, uh, Haggai, which precedes him, is only two. So, um, uh, he, uh, the, the writings attributed to him uh, take uh, up about 22% of, of the 12 minor prophets. But anyway, he, um, he actually probably contributed uh, chapters 1 through 8 in Zechariah, 9 through uh, 14 were actually probably written about 150 to 200 years later, and, and we'll talk about why after we read it. Uh, all written probably by spiritual disciples of Zechariah, so if not the prophet himself, uh, people who followed his teachings and his writings very closely but just a different time. Uh, uh, this would have been the t um, after the Persians were actually defeated by the Greeks, Alexander the Great. Um, so, okay. So here is our reading for today. This is Zechariah chapter 9, starting with verse 9 uh, through the end of the chapter. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. That's the first clue right there. See, this was written later, okay? All right, then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south, and the, and the Lord Almighty will shield them. They will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be full like a bowl, used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. 
how attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. So, all right. So we're going to, um, I think, I, uh, actually the writers of the teacher's guide suggested this, and I think it's a good idea to kind of break this down. So first of all, and, and of course, our reference is uh, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Um, and all four Gospels have that story, which, uh, according to Bible scholars, make its accuracy and validity um, and reliability more so because it's in all four Gospels. Um, some of them uh, actually contain this scripture. Matthew actually says, as the scripture, or to fulfill the scripture, and he actually quotes this. Um, some of them just say, as foretold by the prophets, and don't go into any detail. But it is in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Um, so we want to talk about what's in this scripture reading that we're looking at today and try to um, <coughs> think about and discuss maybe um, how Jesus actually fulfilled this proph prophecy and how it was uh, different than what people expected. It's kind of interesting that even though this prophecy was written over 500 years before Palm Sunday, the event in the events in the New Testament, that um, people still expected a different Messiah, didn't they? Yes, yes they did. So, uh, let's look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which is the, the verse that we're uh, most familiar with. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Okay, at the time when Jesus lived on earth, what were the people's expectations about the Messiah? Great warrior leader. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, one of the first things Matthew does in Matthew chapter 1, and, and Matthew was uh, writing primarily to uh, uh, if you will, market the gospel to Jews. So he starts out with this very nice genealogy, right? Um, and traces Jesus' lineages, lineage, especially to David, because they were all looking for another David. Everybody was looking for another David. Uh, to redeem Israel and uh, recreate the kingdom that they had when he was king and Solomon was king. So, um, that's exactly what they were looking for. A king at, at Jesus' time, uh, the enemy or the adversary, of course, was the Roman Empire. So we went through several empires, uh, world history, uh, in the Old Testament to get to the time of Jesus. So uh, the Assyrians, uh, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans. Okay? So, and these were huge empires, huge covered pretty much all the known world. So anyway, uh, what was included in the prophecy that we just read that should have given them different expectations? He's riding on a donkey. Nobody rode those donkeys. No king, no king no rode into town on a donkey or on the foal of a donkey, that's for sure. Kings usually came into town, whether they were warring kings, con uh, uh, conquering uh, the city, or if they were a king returning to the city uh, from battle or even visiting the city, they came in on a, either a horse or in a chariot, most of the time in a chariot, uh, drawn by a horse, not on a donkey. So humble, humility, right off the bat, right? Okay. Um, we already talked about the fact that all four Gospels uh, tell the story, and we could, we could read it, but I know we're, we're all uh, pretty familiar with it. How is Zechariah's prophecy fulfilled by Jesus? He comes in. He 
came in on a job. And people were praising and rejoicing, which is what uh, Zechariah tells them to do, right? Rejoice greatly, shout. Okay. All right. All right, so let's look at the rest of the reading. Um, we're going to look at specifically at 10 through 17. Yes. Um, okay. So I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay, first question. What word will he speak to the nations? Peace. He will proclaim peace to the nations, right. And how far will his dominion extend? Sea to sea. sea to sea, river to the ends of the earth. Okay. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. In a lot of things we call that, we see, um, what do we call it? Sheol, you see that a lot, Sheol. Basically, in modern terms, Hades or hell basically but or um, what is what do the uh, what does the Catholic Church call the um, kind of purgatory. purgatory yes thank you yes so uh, kind of suspended or condemned okay return to your fortress O prisoners of hope even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Okay, so how will he set the prisoners free? Because of the blood of my covenant. Now, in this particular context in Zechariah, even though this portion was written um, well, it was written well before Jesus. Therefore, they're talking about the Old Covenant here. But we can apply the same scripture to our situation in the New Covenant. And how does Jesus free us from the waterless pit? Prisoners of the waterless pit. Does the law free us? Did the law free them? No. His blood. His blood, his death and resurrection, right? Right. So he um, atoned for our sins through his death and overcame, I mean, through his death and overcame the consequences of sin and death by his resurrection. Okay, so we have that hope. Prisoners of hope, now we are. Okay. Um, in what way will he be like a shepherd? Did I get that far? I may not have got that far in the reading. Um, it, it says he will save his flock. And which image does Zechariah use, or the writer of this portion of Zechariah, to show how God will view his people? He sees that he's a shepherd to his sheep, yes, but he sees us like jewels in a crown. Right? We've heard that. Okay. okay. Um, so, altogether, uh, rather than a mighty warrior, uh, and in my daily Bible study, actually, I'm, I'm, I, just moved, I just finished First Chronicles today. Uh, but in uh, First Kings and Chronicles, you know, uh, David wanted in the worst way to build the temple himself. But... God said, no, I don't want you to do it. And David drew up all the plans and gathered a lot of the resources. But he said, I don't want you to do it because you are a man of war and you have shed too much blood. And sure enough, uh, Solomon had it all laid out for him when he took over. Um, David had secured all of the borders of uh, Israel and there was no war during Solomon's time. So Solomon was able to build the temple with the resources and according to the plans that David had assembled before he, he died. Anyway, 
so our our savior or our king our messiah rather than being another david a man of war uh, was uh, a humble uh, prince of peace and what is the one thing that um, that Jesus repeats over and over again in all of the Gospels to his disciples and the crowds to whom he spoke. They will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Right? So that is what separates uh, Jesus and his way from the way of the world. Um, the, te the teacher's guide, uh, uh, just how we take this with us out of the classroom, uh, says, um, ask the question, um, what are some of the wrong ideas that many people today have about who Jesus is? Um, I know that, uh, now I haven't studied any of the other world religions extensively, but I know that most of them do recognize that Jesus the person did exist, and they consider him a good man, um, and uh, maybe a, a holy man, uh, and a prophet, but not the savior uh, that we, that, you know, the way we regard him. Um, do you, um, I don't really have, a, um, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure how to articulate my perception of sort of where we are in our country and our world in a um, general sense. There are a lot of uh, people out there, hopefully like us, who strive to uh, become more like the Savior every day. We want people to see uh, we are Jesus' hands and feet in this world, and we want people to see Jesus. If we preach Jesus, we got to, like, what does our pastor say? He says, uh, we got to learn, love, and live Jesus, because that's how people see Jesus. Um, so, and, and I think our church, all in all, uh, not... We always individually and collectively have more that we can do um, to uh, improve our relationship with God, become more and more holy, sanctified, um, and become more, conform more to the image of Christ um, every day. Um, but what do you think uh, the majority of people in our country and in the world um, what, what do you, what, how do you think they see Jesus and Christians? Do you think they see Jesus and Christianity as irrelevant? Irrelevant? Yeah, that's the, that's the first word that popped into my mind, irrelevant. Does it have anything to do with my life, the way my life is, you know? Um, probably one of the reasons we have so many mental health problems <laughs> in our country um, so much anxiety and depression um, and uh, I can't imagine uh, not having because they don't hear the good news because, because they don't want to hear, hear the because they don't hear it they don't hear it why why don't they hear it Do because hear it's it? not being said <laughs> Yes. And people are. It takes a lot of courage sometimes for people to talk about Jesus because you're looked at as, you know. And we, yes. We really have to depend on them, which is before what you're speaking about, before the Holy Spirit was released, we, you know. Yes. Um, I think that we have to be bold and courageous. Mm -hmm. uh, as Pastor Dale says, we don't want to be, what does he say? What does he say when geeks for geeks is it geeks for something or I don't know you um, if you don't if you don't respond to people or approach people in the right way 
uh, you can do more harm than good. Does that make any? Yeah. I don't know. I think the best way, the best way, is to live a life uh, that is different from other people. That they see the um, joy and peace that you have in your <laughs> life, and they ask you, like, how can you, how can you be like that? in today's world, how can you, you know, um, and then they open the door for you to share. You know? Well, I got, I got somebody, you know, right in here. And so, it says to pass it on. Yes, yeah, yes, <laughs> pass it on. And you know, actually, also in my morning Bible study, I, would, I wish I had written it down, um, there was a passage in, in 1 Corinthians, I think, where Paul says, how, how can a person, uh, not, I'm paraphrasing of course, but how can a person develop a relationship with God uh, or believe in God if they don't uh, hear the word? How do they hear the word if nobody tells them? Do you remember that passage? And, uh, and so uh, we all have, uh, we are all grateful to our Lord and Savior for what he's done for us. And uh, we should look for every opportunity to share that however we can uh, to other people. Um, and our world look, really needs it. As we look it. at the world, we live in the United States with the freedom of worship. So many are dying yes. for their belief. Yes. Yeah. And yes. I've often questioned, would I be willing? Yeah. Would I truly be willing? Well, the Lord says in Revelation that that time is coming. Right. <laughs> yes. I'm not looking forward to it. <laughs> I have to say. I love my Lord, but I'm, I'm not looking for, uh, forward to tribulation and, and trial and the potential of being killed for my faith. But uh, there are people out there, uh, lots, of uh, lots of them, every day, every day. Always been here. Yes. So uh, here again, gratitude for our the life that we have, I'm grateful every day that I was born a citizen of the United States. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And uh, it's a shame that more people, or some people, doesn't appreciate it. We have people that do not appreciate it. Let me tell you who appreciate it the most is the people who um, are naturalized citizens here and, and who have to study. <laughs> about citizenship. Uh, I think every once in a while we should all uh, maybe retake high school civics <laughs> so we can actually appre appreciate uh, what we have here. First. That's, are they not teaching it anymore? No. They're not teaching civics? No. Oh man. Yeah, so again, how our young people really are growing up in a world devoid of any um, appreciation for uh, who we are as a nation and who we are as Christians. A lot of people aren't taking their children to Sunday school and church. And so anyway, it's worrisome. But uh, we are called to do our part. And um, I think our church is involved in a lot of local, state, national, international missions. Um, I know we all probably support uh, some missions on our own, uh, apart from, you know, even from the church and uh, all, but, uh, but here again, we're called every day to find new opportunities, right? Okay. All right, well, let's say a prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son, uh, Jesus Christ, um, giving us uh, the example of his life here on earth, um, who we should be or try to be, um, 
what we should do, what we should say, how we should share the good news of salvation through his death and resurrection, um, to lift the burden of sin and death, um, and all that we face in today's world from those around us, however we can. Uh, we love you, Lord. Again, we thank you so much. Help us each day to strive to be more like Jesus, to be more conformed to his image, because we know by doing so, uh, we will grow closer to you. Um, and that you are what we lean on, uh, our shepherd. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, Asbury class. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for celebrating our country this morning in Sunday yeah. school and what wonderful things we have and can do in our country um, and how we can make it better. Thank you. Wednesday night dinner is going to be special next week because. It is hosted by our very own Suzanne. Um, it will be catered and a contribution of $20 per person. Choir gets the early bird. I think that starts at 515 and the rest of us will be there um, to eat what's left <laughs> at 530. Um, and if anybody needs to know where Suzanne lives, Go to Google. Yeah. No, we'll, we'll be sending it out. Oh, okay. Pat's going to send it out. Um, let's see. Then you'll need Google. Else. Bill. Please, I think you need to make reservations. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. But you, it's best to make a reservation rather than show up without <laughs> making one because. Or you may not you may get not your eat. dinner because you don't you have any. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Request RSVPs in your notice. Okay, all right. And Bob, welcome to the second floor again. Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness, it's lovely to see your smiling face back there. Um, I, Patty. We have a guest. We do. Janet Stanner. She's not really a guest in the oh, church. Yeah. She's a guest. Two Sundays. Come on, son. Well, welcome, welcome to the second floor. <laughs> yes, of course. Welcome back, Dolores. It's good to see you, too. Um, I asked Marilyn. You know, Marilyn knows everything that's going on in her church. No. And, <laughs> and outside of it, I wish I didn't know. <laughs> and a lot outside of our church. And I asked Mary of Marilyn to think about needy organizations that might enjoy some of our money that we have accumulated, which amounts to about seven hundred dollars. Um, Marilyn, did you? I have not concluded anything, but we're. The middle schoolers are not going to the camp this year, so we won't have the expense of the meal, which is an additional money that we have. But uh, there are just so many organizations and groups who could use $200, $500, $100. So if you know of something, an organization, a group, please let me know and we'll put it into the consideration cup. Okay. okay. We can All always right. consider the fact that we're behind on our budget in church. I'm I know, sure and, and that, that is... That was part of a consideration yeah, yeah. also. Yeah. 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 Or something, rela a particular program relating to that, which brings to mind, we ladies need to make our reservations, including me, uh, for the summer salads 
because we don't know how much food to prepare and we don't know how many people are coming. There are so many women who were in church this summer, Sunday, excuse me, who had no idea what I was talking about. And, and, and do you read your bulletin? Do you read your Wednesday? I'm just amazed. Oh, yeah, that sounds really nice. You know, when? when where? Uh, what's those dates? So, but we do need reservations, and you can do that online. Okay, all right. Are there any other announcements? <laughs> Several of our members are traveling over um, the long weekend and for the next few weeks, so let's keep them in our prayers to be safe. I hope um, they're not flying. <laughs> oh yeah! Oh my gosh! I'm, I'm glad I'm not going any place this weekend. I'm just happy to be home. Oh, an update on my animal world. <laughs> I I returned my daughter's cat, who was the downstairs cat in my house for the last month. She had foot surgery, so I took this cat. But this cat did not get along with my cat. That had to be the upstairs cat. So we are now back to one cat. The alligator hasn't come back. Um, How about the frogs? I haven't seen any more frogs either. I don't know where that one came from. I have no idea. Um, but he, apparently he didn't have any relatives. So. It's really, really good. Phil, you want to leave us laughing? I'm sorry. And you haven't buried any more records. No, no, I have not I have not done that. And I don't dare tell my family that I did that. You were told. Yeah. They found a headless chicken in a bag on the point this way. And there was also a snake in the sanctuary. Yes. Thank you, Bobby. I know. <laughs> and there's a big black snake that hangs out around the office, so be careful. They only eat mice. <laughs> and baby chicks. <laughs> An ad in the paper, lemon pickers needed in Florida. Only U.S. citizens or legal immigrants need to apply. Lemon pickers needed. Well, Miss Janice Stevens of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, read it and decided to apply for one of the jobs that most Americans would, uh, were, were not willing to do. She submitted her application for a job in a Florida lemon grove, but seemed too far qualified for the job. She has a liberal arts degree from the University of Southern California, a master's degree from the University of California at Berkeley, <laughs> and for a number of years she had worked as a social worker and also as a school teacher. The former, the foreman studied her application, frowned and said, I see that you are well educated and have an impressive resume. However, I have to ask you, have you ever had any an actual experience in picking lemons? Well, as a matter of fact, I have. I've been divorced three times, <laughs> owned two Mishibishi automobiles, voted twice for Obama, once for Hillary, and unfortunately for Biden. She started yesterday. <laughs> 